Good day. Welcome to another episode of Masonic Curators. Uh, as I mentioned uh, in our first episode that we uh, taped, uh, Chuck Elliott is, is here today. Uh, from Moon Island, and uh, Chuck brought his video equipment because we're working with a uh, skeleton crew here today. But Chuck was also nice enough to bring up a number of great pieces from his personal collection. Um, now, at some point in time, hopefully, uh, we'll be able to grab some of those prisoner of war, Napole uh, Napoleonic era uh, medals that Chuck has. Uh, I believe he has uh, about eight or ten of them, uh, twenty or forty or fifty of them. Uh, but as I mentioned, he has one of the largest Masonic collections I've ever seen. But today I have just a small grouping of some of the Mark Master Mason medals that he has, um, that he was kind enough to bring in, and the different shapes uh, that they came in. Now, when we do the video, we're going to we have pictures of the meadows that we're talking about today that we're going to post with the video, as well as I have found a few pictures of some great looking Mark Master Mason meadows uh, from various past auctions that we're also going to incorporate in, in with the video. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things is, first, they are called a Mark Master Mason meadow. Sometimes they're called a Mason Meadow, sometimes they're called a Mark Meadow, sometimes they're called a um, Masonic Jewel, uh, they go by various names, but it should be a Mark Master Mason Meadow. The reason being, now you have to go back to episode number 84 of Masonic Curious, that's where companion Lou and I, we talk about Royal Arts Chapter Pennies, and we briefly talk about, uh, or I do, the Mark Master Mason Meadows. Uh, they are either called meadows or jewels. Uh, they go by two two things of terminology. Um, these basically the, some of the earliest ones that I've been able to find uh, date back to about the seven very about 1790. Uh, they were very prominent between 1800 and about 1824-25, uh, just around the period of time when the Intermasonic era. Uh, sort of hit, which is about uh, 25, 26. Um, now, I do not know when the first Mark Master Mason medal or jewel was made, uh, nor we are. Uh, we do know that from records that in 1769, that there is a first record of a Mark, uh, Mark Masonry here in the United States, but I know it went in much before that. Uh, here in the world, uh, there is a minute book from the Lodge of Edinburgh that makes note about brethren making their marks, which date to 1599. Um, a few questions that I would like to know, uh, have answered is, uh, the main one is how these got actually got started. Uh, they do predate chapter pennies, so we can't say these evolved from the chapter penny. I believe these evolved, uh, the chapter penny evolved from the Mark Master Mason Meadow. Uh, but what I'd like to know is, is how these got started, and also how these spread through the various states here, or the colonies, uh, here in the uh, eastern part of the United States. Uh, we do have samples from Pennsylvania, New York, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire. Um, so how these got from one state to the next, to the next, to the next, uh, and, and were made, do not know. Um, now, a Mark Master Mason medal is basically a piece of silver. Uh, they... I have seen one done in gold, but the uh, prominent metal is silver, uh, except this one here is a little bit darker in the metal. I don't know if that is because it's tarnished, or there's some sort of a coating over it, or 
whether or not it is still, I'm not exactly sure just yet, but since this doesn't belong to me, I'm not going to try to clean it uh, to see. But the rest of them that Chuck has are all silver. Um, they usually came in a number of different shapes, sizes. Uh, they would have, again, we're going to have better images when we post these up. Uh, they will have the person's mark and or Masonic emblems uh, on both sides. They would have his mark on one side, Masonic emblems on the other. Uh, here's an excellent one that has Masonic emblems on one side and on the other one. Uh, it has uh, the individual's mark and a date of 1801. Now this one here is more of a, not an oval shape, uh, it's hard to say exactly what shape this one here is. Uh, we do have the oval shape. We have the most common of the shapes, the shield. I've seen them in hot. I've seen them in oval. I've seen them in round. And then this one here is, I would call this more of like an acorn shape style. As I said, they did come in. I've seen them like in a hot shape and various other shapes. Um, they date from different periods, as I mentioned. Uh, Chuck has one from 1801. Um, this one here dates to, excuse me, I have to put on these, these glasses to see this one. There is no date on it. Uh, it does have his name on this one and what lodge it was. So we're going to do a little bit of research on this one. Uh, this one here dates to uh, 1823. Uh, this one here is extremely worn, and that's going to be part of the second part of the talk um, I can make out 18 now whether or not this is 1818 or 18 something do not know but I believe more than likely it's 1818 that this mark is uh, made uh, I consider these pieces of art because uh, th these weren't done by Joe Schmo these were done by professional silversmiths uh, which again, I asked the question, how did this work from a silversmith that made it in New York uh, almost exactly the same as a silversmith here in Boston, Massachusetts make roughly the same type of metal with the same type of engravings on it. Uh, you know, they didn't pick up a telephone and there was no, you know, uh, fax machines uh, or, you know, sending something on the, uh, I, your iPod. Uh, so how that jewel went from Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, New York, uh, Connecticut, Massachusetts, how that style and the, and the same techniques, do not know. Um, another question, and I pretty much know the answer to this one, is how they were worn. Now, they weren't made into watch fobs uh, because that wasn't, done in, in this period of time. Um, they were more made into a charm. And a uh, couple of things is, uh, they really weren't any, I believe, pockets on the outside of the jackets at those days. But guys did pin things to the jackets. Um, could they have been put on some sort of a ribbon uh, and then pinned to the jacket? Yes. Uh, could they have been worn around the neck in a silver, you know, silver or gold neck? Yes. Um, in one case, um, they were, believe it or not, put in the pocket, either in a, not a wall, but a billfold, which they called back in those days, or in the person's pocket. And we're going to have a, a good picture of this one. This one here is almost completely erased. And how does that happen? Well, it doesn't happen from wearing it around the neck or wearing it here. No, it happens from putting it in your pocket or if you put it in, you know, you put a coin in your billfold or a, a key and you wear that over and over and over and over again, it wears, the leather actually wears down the metal. And of course, putting it in your pocket wears down the metal. That's how this was carried around. It's a pocket piece. Um, two instances that I have seen and so it is a fact that how they were worn, they were worn with a collar around the neck. Uh, the individual probably had it on a, on a nice, you know, velvet collar, and he wore this around the neck, and as he went to the Royal Arts chapter or the Mark Master Mason chapter, 
and or the Masonic Lodge, because some lodges were allowed to confer some of these other degrees. Uh, he would wear it on a collar around his neck, like a lot of the early past master jewels were worn like this. They weren't worn on the breast, they were worn on a collar. So here's a few mock master mason jewels that I, as I said, I, I don't, I consider them very historical, but I also consider them beautiful pieces of artwork because each one is completely different. And if you take the time and, and you can do some search and Google some images, um, you're gonna see a number of similar styles, um, the oval and the shield, but you're gonna see some great pieces of engraving done by some magnificent uh, silversmiths. And it is also said, and I haven't seen one yet, but I believe uh, I've heard of two instances where Paul Revere, uh, the engraver or silversmith, uh, actually made, a, made two Mark Master Mason medals for his friends. So they're out there. Uh, you can find these, believe it or not, still on eBay. You can find a lot of these at auctions. Uh, you can find, and I <laughs> just want to let you know that you can find these at a place that you wouldn't think that you find them, but I have heard that one was found at a yard sale, believe it or not. Um, they're out there. Uh, some of them can demand high prices. Uh, unfortunately, for my research that I've done, um, and I'm not a silver expert, is that not many of these were marked by the silversmith, unfortunately. Um, though a number of them do have the person's name on it with the large number, large name, and like this one here is Schenectady, New York, and um, we have a few others here that have the large names and locations. Some do not always have the large names on it, some do not always have the person's name on it completely, some do not always have a date, but uh, they're very interesting pieces. So do some research on them. Uh, look up some images. Uh, if you happen to like what uh, you've seen here today, give us a thumbs up. Uh, if you have any comments, please give us a comment. If you want to see something different uh, from Masonic Curators, uh, leave us a comment. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, if not, uh, continue watching our recent videos. Watch some of our past videos. Brother Jared did a beautiful piece. I do not know the episode number but he did a magnificent one, I think about four or five years ago, about a uh, soapstone mock Master Mason medal uh, made out of soapstone with the individual's uh, uh, mock that is on it. A beautiful piece that he has. Um, watch some of our past ones and thank you very much. Good night.